All righty. So um, I'd like to open this not, well, it is a school committee meeting, but not an official school committee meeting. We're calling this a workshop. This is an opportunity for school committee members to talk about um, the various scenarios of the cuts that um, we've been asked to make. And, um, but before we get into that, I just want to, um... I know. <laughs> Anyways, um, sorry. Um, it's important to, um, to mention um, or to acknowledge George Floyd and um, the pain and suffering of um, the black and brown communities and also our society in general. And um, as a school committee member, as a member of this community, I think it's important to um, have a more thoughtful conversation. So I'm hoping that tomorrow we can um, talk about this in a, in a more um, thoughtful manner and, and how the school and how the school can work th with the community to, um, to take responsibility, to educate and to um, build awareness. And um, so I'm hoping for that conversation and not just one conversation, but many more to come. So with that, first of all, I apologize. And, um, but I, I just want to announce to the attendees, thank you very much for, um, for coming this evening. This is a, a workshop, so we are not going to take questions or comments at this time. However, uh, we invite you to come tomorrow night to our regularly scheduled school committee meeting at five o'clock. And um, we will have public input, we'll have questions, we'll allow questions during the um, FY21 budget agenda items. So um, take your notes, have your questions, and um, please, come tomorrow and if you can't email me at schair at email.medfield.net. Alrighty, so right now I'm gonna pass this on to um, to Jeff and Michael to go through the various scenarios. Thanks Anna May. Um, <clears throat> Michael's gonna share his screen. Uh, we have a just a couple of slides and we're gonna go through some of uh, the spreadsheets uh, and some recommendations that we have. Um, going forward. So I don't know if you could do that, Michael. Thank you. So just wanted to give some background. We figured that we might have some folks here that um, haven't been to any of the public hearings or the meetings or whatever. So we want to just give, give kind of a background of, you know, how we got here and, um, you know, what our, what our, our process has been. Instead of going through that entire process that we typically do through a public hearing and that, that entire presentation, I want to just give you kind of a high level of where we've been and what we've done. So typically we start doing our budget in October, November, we start generating that with our department heads and our principals and our assistant principals and directors. And, and we, we gather all that information and then we build our budget through, you know, 30 plus meetings individually with the department heads and, and principals and, and try to get a sense of what they're asking for and why. And then um, Michael and I put together a budget and we do an initial presentation in December to the school committee, which we did this year on, on December 5th. Um, at that point, it's still the superintendent's budget. Uh, we go through, we build that budget, but on the public hearing night, um, that's the opportunity that I have as superintendent to present what I think uh, is the best budget for our community and for our school district. At that point, the school committee can either accept that, that number um, or ask me to go back and, and rearrange some things. Uh, at the January 30th meeting, they voted our budget, which was a 4.02% increase um, over FY20, our, our current year. So that was where we were then. Um, we had multiple school committee meetings after that in which we um, discussed the budget and looked at, at guidance. Um, you know, part of the issue this year was it was just a weird year. So. Um, we were in, in full steam ahead mode in terms of our budget development and everything was on schedule. The governor released his first budget and then typically the Senate and the House re released theirs and then it ends up somewhere in the middle. 
uh, but then COVID-19 hit in March and everything went to a standstill. So the town side had to go to a standstill because they didn't know what numbers were gonna be used from the state. We had to do this exact same thing. So we had really um, not a lot of conversation and budget development that happened for about a six week period because we were all waiting to see what was going to happen. Um, since that time, we've gotten, we've got guidance from uh, the state on that. They typically um, have their budget done in um, <clears throat> beginning of June, end of June, sometimes it stretches in the beginning of July. Um, they're telling us right now it's going to be mid-July, the earliest, and possibly in August. So that presents problems for us because we typically get about $6 million in Chapter 70 money on top of what we get for local taxes. So um, it's kind of hard to be building a budget and then cutting a budget when you don't really know exactly where the money is going to, whether the money's going to come in or not, because there is still that possibility, um, like in 08 and 09, when uh, the federal government actually stepped up at that point and, and backfilled districts so that we got uh, Chapter 70 money and the towns got their local aid. So that's what we're, we're kind of hoping for. So all this is being done really with the assumption that we're not getting any additional money from the state um, other than uh, a 10% reduction and we're getting no stimulus money. So that those are the assumptions that we make during this process. Very difficult to not only build a budget but then decide what you're going to cut when you don't know what the money is actually going to be. You may not know until you won't know until after town meeting, but just prior to when the school year starts. So I think that's an kind of important backdrop. Uh, there's still some unknowns that we, we just don't know about. Um, we had a couple of Warren Committee meetings as well, and I know that um, the real reason we're having this meeting tonight is to kind of do that workshop piece based on the Warren Committee's uh, vote on Monday night that reduced our overall budget, both operating and capital, by over $1.2 million. So Michael and I have been working with the leadership team and really trying to figure out, you know, how we can go about this process of reducing our budget a um, million dollars. You know, when you come in at 4%, any school district that comes in at 4%, that's pretty average. I mean, I think we figured out it was going to be about 3.5% to open the doors in September. So 4% was essentially a level service budget, but gave us a little extra in terms of um, programming and that we wanted to have or positions. So as we go through this process now, we, we really looked at three things that we, were, we wanted to really maximize during this. So we wanted to look at how, how, when we make these reductions, how can we do it in a way that minimizes the impact for students and their opportunities? So what can we do that, that really doesn't um, hurt the educational process for kids? So that was our number one goal in this whole process is to do that. The second goal was how can we minimize the impact to existing staff? So what can we do uh, for our employees that we, are, that we have currently without going into reduction in force process. Um, there's an easier way to do this, folks. You can just sit there and look at the, the, the list of teachers that are non-professional teacher staffs, and you can pink slip all of those teachers and then kind of let the chips fall where they may. And that's, you know, you're hearing, you're hearing stuff on the news uh, of other communities doing that. We want to take a more thoughtful approach to it uh, because that's, it doesn't do any good to hand out 43 pink slips and then just after figure out how you're gonna divvy up people and where they're gonna go. It's just not fair uh, to our employees and it's, it's just not a fair way to do things. So we chose to be thoughtful about it. And the third thing we wanted to consider because we know that we're all on this the same team right now um, is to minimize the unemployment claims for, for the town. So we are the biggest, largest employer in the town of Medfield. When we lay off people and do reduction in force and eliminate jobs, uh, unemployment claims go through the town and cost the town money. So we wanted to try to do this in a way that uh, would not impact that or minimize that impact. It's gonna impact at some, at some level. So just in terms of the overall request we had was 37,936,699. Um, the total cut to our original operating budget is just over a million. So the new request was 36,877. And then we reduced another 200,000 in our capital request. So the total reduction voted for the Warren Committee on Monday evening was 1.2 million. Um, so that's what we've been working on and trying to get that number down to something that, that frankly doesn't decimate the district. Because there, there's when you look at, at those numbers, you have an enormous impact on education and what our kids do each, each day. So we want to try to minimize that. And again, try to do it in a real, real thoughtful manner. So Michael, I think you're going to go to um, a different screen now. And Jeff, uh, quickly. In order for us to open, just literally open the doors, nothing new, staff at exactly where it is in September or you know late August, what is that percentage number? It's like 
3.5, right? So, so, uh, so we point, out that, yeah. um, you know, typically a level of service when you're looking at a school district is anywhere from um, a three to 6% increase. So right. level service means same people, same programs. So, right. you know, we, we felt like, you know, that, that coming in at the four point, excuse me, the 4.02 was essentially level service, but we had a couple of added uh, programs and that we wanted to go in there. So, and at that point, that was the guidance that we were also getting from the town that we felt as though, or that the town felt that, you know, a 4% around there and we would negotiate some, but that seems like that was a manageable amount. Yeah. I think, you know, there's a couple of things, right? So you have, you know, one of the things that happened is that um, even, you know, prior to COVID-19 and, and before that, all the revenue issues that came statewide, and we were asked initially to cut that million dollars. And then we, we ended up doing 977 at that point. And um, that went down to, you know, 915, you know, give or take. Um, but because you know, the, we were, we were having, as a town, I mean, I think that nobody on the Warrant Committee or the administration or here at this point will be surprised to understand, or taxpayers, quite frankly, that there is kind of a structural problem in that what we have done as a town to make our town livable and the place we want to be is also very expensive. And so our revenue is based almost entirely on taxpayers and that the world's you know, state funding and federal funding has decreased so much over the last 15 to 20 years that what was once kind of an easy assumption around revenue doesn't necessarily always happen. Yeah, so I think- so I think that there's like a middle period we wanna talk about here because Megan and I have spent a lot of time just trying to think about, as have you and Michael, kind of think about like where, uh, where, we, where the pre-COVID budget uh, which is kind of what we've been going for for a balanced budget so that we don't have to ask more from our taxpayers for this year, um, where that number is, right? And and then talk about what we've had to reduce because of the increased uh, concern about revenue going down because of COVID. Right. So, so you kind have of like a three-stage issue here. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, you have the pre-COVID budget, which you know we were asked for the million dollars at the start, and we ended up ended up doing about the nine fifteen or so. Um, and then when you know the town has to generate, you know, has to operate on the on the revenue projections, and um, I think they made a smart choice with the Warren Committee as well to look at that at ten percent. Yeah. So a ten percent reduction at this point, and there are other towns that are doing you know twenty and thirty percent, and yeah. um, and that may happen. We don't know. But I think it was a good move to do the 10%. Um, frankly, there, there could be some additional either stimulus money or if, it's, if the state gives them their rainy day coffers to at least level fund local aid, which would level fund our chapter 70 and level fund the local aid. And what would that mean to us? That would mean probably an additional 630,000 that would that's earmarked for schools that we're not putting in this budget right now because we're projecting that to be cut. So we, we did, again, that's, that's to my point, my point in the beginning that we just don't know. So yeah. there could be an infusion of money if we if we have that additional 630,000 that can negate some of the options that I'm going to share with you today. Right. Michael, do you have that up on the screen? No, this. I don't see it up on the screen. Can you go up, Michael? Can you uh, let us know what's up? I do think. Um, so you guys, you guys can't see the screen right now. No, we can't you can see. see anything yeah, right. it's just blank. It's I just do plain think white. Um, that as a committee, if we want to think about um, what kind of advocacy we can do for ourselves and for our town in terms of writing our legislators and asking for this kind of relief, and perhaps thinking about that as um, a joint letter with the warrant uh, with the the selectmen or on our own or what but i do think that it's important for us to advocate for ourselves for that revenue relief i mean i there are so many things to advocate for right now but obviously revenue relief um money almost always equals how we get uh equity for everybody and um 
I think it's an important thing to do right now that we should really be thinking about how we approach our legislators, the governor, our federal government to say, you know, this kind of relief right now would quite possibly be the difference between um, losing more staff, increasing unemployment, and really what next year will look like too, because I don't know when this is going to specifically end. They, just today, you know, on CNBC, there was somebody who was saying that, that they really think that the, the recession part of this is over and that everything has, <laughs> but that's a stock market kind of um, Yeah. Well, I mean, I think number, and that's not a municipal number. Municipal funding lags. They, they were, Always. you know, there was some some folks that were excited about the CARES Act money that the town was receiving. I know that was. Uh, <laughs> Don't get excited. Yeah, I, I mean, it, I think that's it was 1.1 million on the CARES Act, but you know, the mechanism that they used for that money was a reimbursement mechanism, and that doesn't really make sense. I mean, it, no. in, in 08 and 09, uh, it was it was really used to supplement and backfill what. This, what revenue this, the cities and towns were losing. And this is reimbursement. So essentially, whatever we spent on COVID-19, mm -hmm. we have to submit that right. um, to the government to get reimbursement. So that's really directed for the town and the, it's really specific on what schools can, can do, but it makes no sense. A town like our size is not gonna generate $1.1 million of no. reimbursement out of COVID-19. It is pretty false. It's just it's not gonna false happen. I know that there are communities, and, and Christine has mentioned it as well, that um, that are really advocating for that money to be used to offset the, the loss, the revenue loss that's happening right now uh, at the state level. So if that happens, then you know, then we'll be in, in better shape because we'll have additional funds, hopefully, um, that will come to us. Yeah. So I think that it is important for us to talk about how we can advocate for that on behalf of our town and our kids and our staff. Um, but we can have a discussion about that at a different time on a different agenda. So what if I just go into a couple of things? I know Michael's working on, on sharing that screen for some reason, the spreadsheet's not coming up, but um, you know, one of the things that, that we wanted to look at um, in our cuts, and I wanna go through the personnel piece first. Um, if we look at our non-union non increases, and uh, we have that as a reduction of 95,000, and we've talked about this before, but I think it's important for the impact on that. Um, so that 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 non-union increase impacts superintendent, director of finance and operations, director of instruction and innovation, director of, of student services, accounting specialist, audit district coordinator, data manager, um, secretary of finance and operations, administrative assistant to a superintendent, uh, director of technology, network administrator, human resources assistant, payroll and human resource manager, um, and that's a, something we have shared with the town. Uh, director of facilities also shared with the town. High school principal, middle school principal, uh, Dale Street principal, Wheelock principal, Memorial principal, middle school assistant principal, high school assistant principal, director of food services, athletic director, and director of social emotional learning. So that reduction impacts 24 people directly. Um, and that's the $95,000. So essentially um, freezing all non-union um, salaries in that $95,000 that's allocated to that uh, would be cut out of the budget. So that's the first, the first tier of looking at um, reductions. So then we try to really look at, you know, what are some of the reductions that we can make, uh, again, with looking at existing staff and trying to avoid exist, ex reducing existing staff. So we went through the process and we had some open positions that um, we have, we have uh, posted and we some of them we even started interviewing for and actually appointed people but we let them know that um, the appointment was really uh, contingent upon the FY21 budget so we wanted to look at some of the positions that we put up that um, if we if we got if we cut all of those positions uh, that alone is 22.7 FTEs and that would be 1.4 million um, but we wanted to go through the and make recommendations to you. And then you can tell us, certainly we have a conversation about it, but tell us certainly if we're in the right direction or uh, if there's something we should look at differently. So uh, we looked at the assistant athletic director at the high school and that was a position that we recommended uh, reducing. Hey, it looks like it's up there. We recommended reducing and perfect, there it is. The filibuster work, Jess. <laughs> Great. Um, so if you could see, <clears throat> as, as we scroll down on these, on these positions, 
the ones that we put a red check mark down, those are the ones that Michael and I and through the leadership team are recommending at this time. Um, the whole host of these positions add up to the 1.4 million. What we've recommended on the cuts doesn't add up to that. It's over, over 600,000. So uh, let's see what we got here. You good, Michael? Yep. Okay. All right. So um, looking at the, the first one that we looked at was the athletic, assistant athletic director, and that's at the high school and for the middle school. Um, we thought that was going to be uh, a reduction for this year at $43,000. Uh, Michael, can you that... scroll up a little? Thank you. Um, so that's something that was uh, something we'd recommend. Um, also looking at a 0.8 math teacher uh, with $66,000 reduction at the high school. Um, going through to math specialist at Wheelock, uh, that's an another open position for 2021, uh, reducing that at 66,000. Uh, Wheelock classroom teacher, again, when I say open, I mean, we're just not replacing the person that's there. That's the recommendation here. These are, there are people in these positions now, uh, but they may be open for next year. Um, Teaching assistant positions, it's, it's a couple of positions in there, so that's the 48,000 um, there. We lock classroom teacher, uh, so that's, that's someone that is uh, moving from one position to another within We Lock, and we feel like um, we're not gonna rehire that classroom position, and that will impact class size uh, to make it about 22, 23 at We Lock, so we thought that was something that is sustainable at this point. Um, the innovation teacher in, uh, at, at Dale Street, so that's a retirement uh, that we're looking at not refilling at this point. Um, so there's a savings of 85,000 there. We have another retirement for a kindergarten teacher. Uh, that is a savings of uh, 66, five to 67. Uh, so what we've talked about is uh, not, is closing up full day kindergarten at 160 students. Uh, which we're at right now. So closing that off and we have an additional 16 students that have already registered for half day. Uh, but, you know, cutting that one position there and then you'll see kindergarten is in here again too. Uh, but we think that managing kindergarten at 22 with a couple of 23s with a full-time aid is something that we can manage at this point. Um, you also see we have a leave of absence uh, English teacher at the high school. So we're recommending not replacing that. Uh, at, at this time. Uh, an additional kindergarten teacher, which was a new one, which we had, we had cut in that first pass, is 70,000. Uh, we have a, a long-term or a substitute at, uh, at the uh, high school, that's 35,000. Uh, we're gonna look at furloughing that person for one year leave of absence. Uh, we're looking at central office, uh, re reducing that uh, one person 0.3, which is savings of $10,000. Uh, and then, <clears throat> English teacher at the high school, a 0.5, that's an existing position, um, that's, that will save 29. A business teacher at the high school, 0.2, that saves 12,000. So that is um, another savings from the high school. And then family consumer science at the high school, uh, $20,000 savings, uh, reduction of 0.3. So all of these, these positions that we have listed um, fall under the category of an open position, a new position, um, or retirement that we're looking at reducing. So even though we didn't say the, the math teacher at Blake or the physics teacher at the high school, those are, aren't our recommendations at that point, at this point, but those are positions that fall under the same category. So it is something that if you think we should be looking a different direction in reducing uh, programs or positions, then that's something that we could look at uh, going forward but this is just really our recommendation. And then I'll go through the next piece and then certainly any questions or anime. Yeah, I don't know. Could, should I wait for my questions or? Well, whatever you want to do is fine. Okay, I actually, while we're in it, I just have a couple um, uh, some questions, please. So these open positions and retirements that we're not filling, that's my first set of questions. Right. Um, what does that mean in the classroom? What does that mean for, for, other, um, for other teachers? um in terms of the the impact so it depends on, on what level so i'd say the impact 
at the elementary level would, would be in, increased class sizes. You know, so if you look at what that means, um, you know, you'll see 22 to 23 in, in classrooms at, um, at Wheelock. Um, the kindergarten is really the only place that it's being impacted. At Memorial, so we already said the 22 to 23 there. Uh, Dale Street not replacing, you know, positions there would, would increase. I think Grace four and five are going to be large next year. So we're looking at, um, Steve and I met today going over that and you're looking at an, uh, a range of classrooms at Dale Street from 22 to 25. Um, throughout the school. So I think you're going to see an impact definitely because that, there's a large class going through, a two large classes going through um, at Dale Street and we had added additional positions for those before in, while they were in Wheelock to bring down those class numbers and those class sizes. But um, if we don't rehire some of these, then it will bring that up to between 20, 22 and 25. I mean, it's certainly not ideal, right? I mean, having 25 kids in a classroom is not ideal. It's also not unheard of. Right. So, right. Um, I mean, I think that's the way we got to approach this, that it's, it's, um, it's not what we're used to in Medfield, uh, but it's certainly not unheard of either. Okay. So now with the furloughs and the existing um, teachers, now, now, for example, an English high school English teacher, 0.5. So are you making an existing full-time teacher part-time? or is someone part-time? Right, so that's gonna be a situation where classes will be, sections will be lost there. So you'll, you'll probably see an increased class size in the English department. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely uh, a reduction in what can be offered. I think anything you see at the high school is a reduction in on what can be offered for, for kids, but also increased class sizes throughout. I mean, I think that, you know, Christine Power made a really good um, assessment the other day when she you know it can't be the way it was right now so right so are these individuals because now you know when you think of open positions when you take think of retirements you think all right someone's not getting that notice now i'm looking at this section here and um those are people those are real people who would yep. otherwise have jobs Correct. and um so they're, so they're reductions they're fractional reductions to what they're they're full-time frac with fractional reductions okay yeah and and can you um, now with furlough? What does that what does that mean? They can keep their benefits. Correct. But correct. So um, you know that particular position is a unique situation. So I think the furlough is uh, makes the most sense there, as opposed to a leave of absence. Um, we could do either uh, either there, but you know furlough isn't used a lot in in the public sector, but it certainly is used a lot in the private sector. Uh, so essentially, it's, it's going to be someone on leave of absence, but uh, still retains benefits um, in that position and can, can come back. So can come back whenever it makes sense. So right now we're saying it's going to be an entire year. Uh, but if we get additional money back from the from the state, you know, it might be a half a year for a low in that position. So, you know, again, a lot of this is is a lot of what ifs, which I, I don't like having what ifs in June. Right. Um, that, that's the most frustrating part is that we're in a position where you know, typically the budget's set in May and we're done by the, by June and we know everything is happening. So it's it's really, it's frustrating for us, but it's even more frustrating and, and, and anxiety provoking for staff because we're still having these conversations about reductions and, and they just don't know. Uh, Jeff, I have two questions. Anime, I'm sorry, are you done, Anime? Yeah, yeah for now, yeah. Um, I don't, we don't have to talk about this right now, but I wanna, I wanna make sure that we put a pin in this particular conversation um, about what the cluster structure will look like at Blake Middle School if we're reducing by um, or not replacing a math teacher and uh, and how that kind of impacts that um, how we organize kids within that within that school. The other thing I think I'm most concerned about is the math specialist position at Wheelock. If we're mm -hmm. looking at larger class sizes and math, um, math has kind of been a little bit under supported at Wheelock. 
And if we are going to be looking at kids who need more help over time, particularly considering that they have not been in school uh, for quite some time, I know that we have a, a great deal of, of reading support there and that's fantastic. Of course, it's never enough, but uh, I think sometimes math gets the short shift. And I honestly don't know the solution to that, but I do think it's important that, that we talk about it because uh, one of the reasons or one of the things I came into this meeting with today um, was to really truly try to think about what my, uh, what my biases were about every single one of these positions that, that I'm trying to come into every meeting at this point, reflecting on what my perceptions are versus what might be reality. So, so I think that that's the one that, that is the most alarming to me because I want to make sure that this is, you know, math specialists are for kids who are not necessarily on IEPs or at that level, but definitely need increased support. So, and, and I'm ex obviously, you know that I'm explaining that to, to other people. So, can we talk a little bit about what that decision was like um, and where yeah, so, that came from and how we feel about that? Sure. So, I mean, I think that, that all valid points. Um, I would say that uh, we do have um, an assistant that, or assistant position in that, in that uh, school that would help out in that. Um, I mean, I think it's, I mean, none of this is easy, right? I mean, none of this no. is easy and it's, and we felt like, uh, the assistant that's been in there and, and, and working in there has done a wonderful job. And if she stays in the district, then um, she would be able to support kids at, at a very high level. And we felt good about that. Uh, it's, yeah. It's, it's so this is somebody who would go perhaps somewhere else within the district, but would not be then at Wheelock. No, so I mean, kind of, I think she could go to another district and get a job very easily. So yeah. it's whether or not she wants to stay with us and, and be a, a, an assistant on that role or she wants to okay. uh, do it somewhere else. So, um, okay. yeah, I mean, there's still going to be some support there. It's not like we're taking all the support away from Wheelock in terms of mathematics, yeah. uh, but it wouldn't be the math specialist as, as they have in, um, in the other buildings right now. Okay. I mean, I just, I, I think I needed to, to really understand kind of where the decision making was a, around that and how, you know, it, that's one of the, the truly kind of like um, support positions, you know, that, that will be lost that I think we're, we're all going to end up having to struggle with a lot of academic support um, and kids that maybe we just didn't understand needed it before this and then they come back in. But I also think that that is going to be the classroom teachers job in general you know yeah, and I also think that it's you know there's an opportunity to look at a model where we share math specialists you know among the three schools and, and that kind of thing so that it's nice to have one at each building and that's what we should have but in, in this particular case we have to think differently and and okay. maybe it's a situation where a math specialist you know works at Memorial on Monday Wednesday Friday and at we lock on a couple of days and we switch I mean those are the kinds of things and again, the, the whole backdrop of all this, I know we've talked about this, but we don't even know what September is going to look like yet, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, when some of these decisions that we're making now, and if we're going remote, I would recommend, if I knew right now we're going remote in September, I'd recommend a very different line of cutting. Right. This, this, is, this is with the assumption that we're going to school as we know it, or a, you know, a, mo a hybrid model that we're in school sometimes and outside. So it's, that, that's the assumption we're making in this process. So if, if I was, you know, if they told us tomorrow that we're going fully remote, then this will look very, very different. Right. I mean, obviously, yeah. And it's, it is very the, hard to figure that's out. That's the other piece that's added to this, right? So you don't know what the right. budget's going to be. You don't know what the state money's going to be. Oh, and by the way, what the heck's school going to look like in September? Yeah. So, I mean, you get a lot of what ifs in this, in this particular exercise. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that I, I asked the right questions yep. about that. Um, no, you're right, Jess. I think that you know, oh, I just wanted to try to um, translate for anybody watching and actually for myself, looking at this list here, and correct me if I'm not summarizing this right, but anything that was a retirement or an open position means that that was something we were hoping to fill, but no one is being, no one is getting cut from their job. 
Well, I would say that that position is filled right now. Those jobs are filled right now. So in this school year, they're filled. Uh, but either people are, you know, Retired. moving on, or we need additional staff somewhere. We're just not adding it. And so, so these, not it. but the existing positions, not bodies. Okay, but those that are labeled existing are people that are actually losing point, you know, three or point seven. Or is there any that is completely losing a job? The, the three that we have there right now are fractional, um, and I would say that the teaching assistants, those are those are lost jobs, yes. Yeah, but those were fractional jobs that um, one, one's a 0.6, one's a 0.4, so they're both, you know, okay. so that e equals the one. Got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, again, this was the way that we try to do it, that it, it's like when we build our budget. We go zero based and we start from the beginning, go all the way up. We don't just apply, you know, a 4% increase and say we're done. So it, it's the same kind of process when you, unfortunately have to reverse and take positions out. It's going position by position, looking at schedules, looking at potentially what the enrollment's going to be in different grade levels and making decisions around that. So um, unfortunately they're value decisions and that's, that's what budget cuts are, they're value decisions. And we have to go through this process and, and go step by step. And again, this is the first time you guys are, are looking at this stuff. Um, so it needs to digest and then we continue the conversation tomorrow. But I think this is, from our perspective, what we think is, is best at this point in time. So for example, um, as you say, this is the first time we're looking at this, so I'm trying to understand. So for example, family computer science, business teaching. So uh, for example, consumer science. sorry? Consumer family, science. Family, so, sorry, yeah. yes, family no, no, no. consumer science, sorry. Um, does that mean we're, we're canceling a course or we're just making the classes bigger? So we look at a, a couple of options. One is is looking at reducing sections of those. So we, we might be able, we might be losing a course or we might be losing a section. And like for instance, um, when we have electives, the, if we're scheduling and, and we're trying to offer electives to kids in this situation, now I'm just talking about in this situation, not generally. Yeah. Um, generally we develop electives based on kids' interest and what would be really important for them. But when we're in a position like we are now, we have to look at electives in which we can have the most kids take. Mm -hmm. All right, and there are there are um, electives in say family consumer science that only fifteen kids can take, and it's capped. Because there are only so but many stoves. That doesn't help so us out, right? So it, you, you have to look at you know what are some of the electives that number one are good for kids, and number two, because we're reducing the amount of electives that we have, that more kids can are able to take and take advantage of. Okay. So again, that goes into some of the decision making as well, where if you have a, a class where you can have 25 or 30 kids in an elective versus one you can have 15. Well, it makes more sense at this point to, to keep the 30 so that we have more options for kids to take electives. Um, I have um, just a couple basic questions. One, the overall list, because there's some that are recommended, some are not. Was that really, again, based on your original drivers, which is like minimal, minimum impact on opportunities for students um, minimum impact of existing staff. Oh, that's, that's, that's everything, Tim. So the, the ones that we chose with the check mark are the ones we feel are the minimum. So, so that, that made, met our criteria. Those are all there for you to see because you may disagree and say, you know what, Jeff, I think we need to look at, um, you know, art in the elementary or something. I don't know. I mean, those, those are just, these are just areas that, that we, the whole list of them are areas that are possible reductions. And we put the red check marks next to the one that we think um, meet, the, meet the criteria that we shared earlier. I have one that I actually don't argue with eliminating the position, but I want to ask about the, the future impact of uh, not filling the position, which is the innovation teacher at Dale Street. I completely agree and understand that this is not something we should be doing right now. But my concern is I've been listening to the Dale Street School um, meetings and kind of thinking about the Dale Street School. And this is a position that uh, if we were to continue to have a robust program around innovation and project-based learning and um, which is really kind of how education is, is going, 
if we had that program in place, there's a good possibility that we could also get that space within the Dale Street School, the new Dale Street School, uh, as part of our reimbursement package. Correct. But if we don't have a robust program in place, then we cannot then add it on. So, so I, would, I don't I would say that MSBA that, would define robust as having a person running the program. Right. So and that is uh, and that's what in our educational plan is. Our educational plan, right. we have we have those science and steam rooms in there as part of our educational plan for Dale Street. And part of the deal is you gotta have someone currently there by the time the school is built that's doing that work. Okay, so by the time the school is built, right. as opposed to right now, as we're doing uh, education, the education plan that we would hand to the MSBA. Which so we do have that, so some time to replace that. So we would have time to replace that prior to the building of the school, yes. Okay, that makes me feel much better. Yeah. Okay, thank uh, I you. Just, I just think, though, I mean, here's the issue, right? And, and again, this is a workshop, so it's kind of free-flowing. The issue here is that we all know that FY22 is worse than this. Right. So if, that's the other thing. If the state, if the state revenue is down six <clears throat> six million right now, and that's from March to now, if COVID nineteen, as we see it today, lasts longer, now you're going to have almost an entire year of a financial cycle with revenue down that low. So it's mm -hmm. going to be very, very difficult in FY twenty two. So I mean, this is just this is just the beginning of this process. I know. I know. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, obviously, when Denise presented, uh, when Representative Garlic presented to the selectmen about town revenue about a month ago at this point, and she was talking about it in 2009, um, we were about, as a town, or I mean, as a state, we were about $4 billion below projections. Is that kind of how, and now we're at least double that? If yeah, we're, I think we're in the sixth ballpark right now. Yeah. So, you know, in the height of the the recession that you know, up to now <laughs> has been probably the worst that, that I've seen and I'd hope never to see again, um, we're doubling down on that right now. Now, hope, hopefully it will be short-lived, but um, we can't, we can't know that. I would just also, um, if anyone that's watching that hasn't seen our public um, hearing presentation, I mean, it's pretty in-depth in terms of the, the detail and why we're doing what we're doing in the original budget. So I would encourage people to look at that if you're interested in, you know, where the budget has been and as opposed to where it is right now. And, and then uh, it gives you a really good picture of, you know, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and then also gives you some background information. So when we're talking about things like FTE and Circuit Breaker and Chapter 70 and all that stuff that, that you understand what, what we mean. So that might be something that's on our website. Click on School Committee. Um, it'll say Budget Information. Click on that, and there'll be a folder for FY21. Um, it's all right there. You can click right on that. Okay. Um, one uh, – never mind. I, I lost it, although I – yeah. Oh, I know. The um, – the programming that we were looking at, in which we kind of saw it as a, a simple, well, not so simple, but a cost shift from sending kids who need uh, kind of life skills and additional um, programming after the age of 18 mm -hmm. and bringing that back into the district, that is still in place because it's, in, is that correct? It is, yep. Okay, so that that's a simple, uh, while that is a new program, it's really kind of essentially a, a budget shift from paying out of state or out of school tuition to bringing that back into, right. into our district. Okay, I wanted to make sure that that was something. So if we go to, um, so, so this is only options, you know, looking at staffing. So we had the, the non-union uh, staff and this is the, the union staff here. If mm -hmm. Michael, if we go to the reduction options. Right. So, these are additional options that, that you have as a school committee to take a look at. Um, again, they, we, we got to the 1.2 without doing any of this, um, but I think it's something that you need to consider and kind of direct us where you want us to go. I, I do want to say that um, numbers two through six are, are deal with um, contract negotiations. So I will read that, but we really can't talk about that. That needs to be a a conversation executive session tomorrow night. 
Um, but I'll read down through the list and we really, again, we can't really talk about um, two through six. So number one of the additional reduction option was the $200,000 taken out of capital and, and, and prepay some computer equipment with FY20 money um, based on some of the savings that we have. I mean, I think that's kind of a no brainer that we should, that's one of our recommendations that, that we do that. Um, one of the things that we could do is a, a one day uh, reduction. And again, this is one of the contract pieces. So I'm just gonna read it and then go to the next one. Uh, a one day, uh, reduction in the teacher's contract. Uh, their current contract is 183 days. If we reduce that to 182, that would be a savings of 127,000. Uh, we, we negotiated in the last contract to look at stipends and we've been doing that now for a few years and increase in te teacher stipends. We have one more year left on that. Um, and then deferring that stipend increase uh, to a different fiscal year, whether it be 22 or 23, would save $100,000. Um, as you know, in our teacher contract, um, there are really three buckets of professional development that we do as a school district. Uh, we have our R&D, which we have teachers do great work over the summer. We have conference and travel where teachers go out to different conferences. And then we have course reimbursement in the contract. Course reimbursement is 42.5 in the contract. So that's teachers uh, wanna take a graduate course, they get it approved by the principal and by me. They take the course, they submit it, and they get up to $750 in reimbursement, uh, but that's capped at 42.5. So if that was taken out, that would be a savings of 42.5. Um, as you know, the mechanism that teachers are paid on their pay schedule is through steps and lanes. So every year um, you get a step and it caps out depending on what, what uh, column you're in. And then lanes is the horizontal movement based on uh, degree attainment. So as teachers get um, additional degrees, they move horizontally across the pay scale. And uh, so that's a lane. So if we froze steps and lanes for FY21, uh, that's a savings of 479,000. Um, our teachers also have negotiated a contract with a 2% cost of living for next year. Um, if that is frozen, that's 461,000. Again, we've accomplished what we think the 1.2 without that, but I'm just sharing these as additional options for you. Um, the reduction in force uh, for open positions in the existing retirement new positions, that's the stuff we just went over. Uh, Non-payroll cuts at 10%. So that's the list that we had given you prior. We went over at a couple of school committee meetings of looking at reducing all the non-payroll lines 10%. That gives us a savings of 275. Um, Non-union increases, which we went over the 95,000. Um, Non-payroll cuts. So that's an additional, in, in addition to the 10% going through again, and doing an additional 50,000. Um, you know, just again, not recommending it, but putting it out there, um, elementary world language program, that entire program would be 251. Um, and then looking at furloughing our youth who are aides from full-time to part-time. So essentially making, and again, we'd have to do this individually because some, some of our folks are attached to students. So we couldn't just unilaterally do this. Uh, but looking at reducing folks from full-time to part-time, if we did that across the board, that would be 666000 as a savings. Again, not, we couldn't do that as a whole, but we want to just kind of give that as an option where we could look in, in, in. But again, if we're going to look at, you know, increased class sizes and we're going to look at some other things, it's, you know, the assistants play a really important part in reducing that student to teacher ratio and that adult to, to, to student ratio. So... These are just reduction options, the 13 that we came up with, um, which all equal uh, 4.6 million. So you can pick and choose as you, as you see fit. Uh, Michael, the next one, the recommendation. So our recommendation uh, based on what you know, we've been working on was to do number one, the prepaid computer capital, the 200,000. Um, to do number seven, the reduction in force uh, with the open positions. And then number eight, the existing retirement and new positions. Um, the additional non-payroll cuts of 10%, excuse me, the 10% non-payroll cuts and then the non-union increases, which gets us to the, the uh, 1.2 million number. So that's, again, what we're recommending. Um, but certainly it's up for discussion and your purview of where you'd like us to go. Jeff, what were the, I mean, kind of high level, what, what were the drivers between those ones versus others? 
Uh, I would say it would be the, the, the three items that we talked about in the beginning. You know, looking at, you know, what, <clears throat> what doesn't impact kids uh, in their programming options the, the most, um, what doesn't impact existing staff the most, and what can we, can we, how can we minimize the uh, unemployment for the town side? We, that's how we got to those. That's what we applied, again, with numbers one and two, number one being the most important. Uh, the second round was number two, and the third round, looking at number three to try to see if that fits into what our proposal is. And you said, again, the union-related were numbers what? The ones that we can't talk about? Uh, okay. Two to six. Two to six, okay. The dog is at the in and out. <laughs> Dogs love Zoom, that's for sure. Well, this is a lot to digest, and a lot of these are very painful. Um, and tomorrow night we vote on on the budget. Right, and I would, if I could just add in a minute, I would say that having been through this before in this role um one of the biggest dangers of even doing how we doing the reductions the way we did as far as reduction in force open positions one of the biggest dangers is trying to get those positions back oh, for sure. uh, you know i mean that's that's the issue especially when we're looking at fy22 and what that could potentially look like when we reduce these these positions uh, it will take us several fiscal years to get get these back several it's not going to be something that we, we pop in next year or the year after and, and we're back to what we were this year. It, it's going to take several, several years for us to get these positions back. And also, you know, these very qualified, valued individuals might very well go to another district, you know. Yeah, so, I mean, I, these open positions that, you know, I've, I've met with these people through Zoom as part of the process. The last part is they meet with me before they're hired. I mean, the, the people that our principals and our teachers as they do their um, their hiring groups, the people they've chosen so far, there's, there's, they'll get a job somewhere very quickly. They're just outstanding. You know, I was actually really excited about um, all of them to come and join our staff, but I think it's, I, I think this is the best way to go at this point. So, uh, you know, one question I have is, when I think of the drivers, right? Like, I mean, you can go in impact of opportunities for students, that's broad. Right, like you, we could go into what does it mean? But one part I think of is the ability to flex for where, you know, the new world of next year. And, you know, I, I, I actually, what I hear loud and clear is, yeah, eliminating those positions, it's a lot harder to get them back, right? So I know there's, there's some areas we can and can't talk about, but I, I do wonder, like, do we think about that as a driver? Um, you know, just as thinking of, of how we're going to um, manage the challenges of next year. I, I think that you know, that's something that, com that comes to mind for me. In, in terms of what the structure is going to look like, Tim? Yeah, I mean, I, and I, maybe this is maybe me being new guy, but we vote on the overall budget. You can still, like at what point if, if do we make some of these decisions? Like um, if we are going to cut staff, at what point does that, happen and I, I think i know but well, i want to just... tomorrow <laughs> i mean i mean i think you gotta you gotta you gotta vote a bottom line number tomorrow but i mean i, I you really got to talk to us about whether you think our our recommendations or where you think we should go or looking at that list i mean you might tell us tomorrow that you want us to go in a totally different direction and that's fine we'll do that uh, but you still you still vote that bottom line budget and you know we work through those numbers and maybe have another meeting early next week or something but uh we, we have to notify staff on non-renewals uh by the 15th of june you know that's something and i think the other component of this that we really haven't talked about yet is we also have to decide if and when we get money who comes back first right like what's the process of that so it's kind of like the looking at the tier cuts now but the reverse of it is okay, let's say the state comes through level funds chapter 70, we get additional 600,000 into our budget. 
then how do we get people back and what positions come back and what's the priority for that? So that's a, another conversation. Very hard to bring a teacher in in the middle of the year. Yeah, who's available? Quality. Right. right. Jeff, number, um, item number eight, um, uh, is that those are positions of people who are retiring or that were new ads? Uh, it just seems like a, it's a very large number. Um, what that's what we went through. Uh, yeah, so that's part of the ones we went through. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, so it's all, it's all part of that that whole that whole spreadsheet. It really has all of them on there. It has the open positions on the top, yep. and, and the existing. Um, you know, we have a couple leave of absence that we're just choosing not to replace, and that, you know, that's, that's safe, safe impact. Yeah. But, you know, they're coming back next year, so we have to find a position for them next year. This it's really a short term uh, solution Fix. to yep. you know, a larger issue. So bottom line, the direct impact on all of our students through this is quite obviously larger class sizes, right? Yeah, I would say that. I would say less opportunities, less selection. I, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at the high school and, you know, um, most pop, one of the most popular classes to get into is, you know, the cooking, um, the consumer science or the business, you know, I, I know there's a club that started because of the business and that's very popular. So I, I think is very popular. Yep. huge and kids are talking about it and it's mm -hmm. an awesome opportunity. And so, yeah, bigger class sizes, but less opportunities. Less exposure to our kids. Class sizes at the high school though, they're, you know, high schoolers are big kids and they know a little bit more of the social contract and how to contain themselves. Um, you know, I still don't want huge classes <laughs> in high schools, but I'm, I'm more worried about, you know, Dale specifically or Wheelock reducing the force there and creating larger class sizes for the younger kids. In perpetuity, essentially, or for the next several years. So that it's not going to get better when they hit second or third. That that's not sitting well with with me. No, and back to Jess's point of, of that um, the math specialists. You know, those are the foundation years, and those. You know, if kids don't, you know, I, I truly believe that those early elementary, you got to give them that solid base for them to to move to move on. So. Uh, it's a tough one. I mean, I know that one of the things Jeff, you and I had kind of talked about is that are the kids who are entering kindergarten assuming assuming that the world is you know like like school used to be yeah at least you know for a large proportion of our school year the kids who are entering kindergarten do not have within their memory being in a group learning situation you know these are kids who have lost their their pre-k experience and the same thing essentially with our first graders or our entering first graders that that many of these kids and particularly the kids who are in the half day program have also lost that long term socialization of being able to negotiate and work within a kind of a larger group and all of those things and so they are very vulnerable at this point as and as are the rest of our kids. I mean, I think it's it's interesting living with a couple of middle schoolers and having uh, friends who have older kids and younger kids, how all of our kids are experiencing this uh, in different ways, but they are all intensely experiencing the the morning, the loss, the loss of developmental milestones that you're supposed to make within social, you know, uh, within a social milieu and within a school milieu and yeah, I mean, I think that that particularly at Memorial and, and Wheelock, I I worry. We all worry, and I don't in any way it, by mentioning this. I want to make sure that that Jeff knows that I am in no way questioning the necessity of it. I just think that if if we're going to feel like we vote for it, then we really have to let it marinate overnight about what that's going to look like and be strategic about how we get it back if we need to right and we'll have other discussions tomorrow in uh in our open meeting and we'll be able to take feedback from people and i know that each person within each school is going to look at these cuts and say no but 
but the high school needs it or the middle school needs it or the you know, memorial school needs it. And we're all gonna, people are gonna kind of go to, to what they know but it's our jobs to think about how it is long range. And it's always been Jeff's job and, and, and I trust him very much with that. I, I've never seen him not project that out, but for us to feel good about it, um, I think we have to put it, well, we will feel good, but we have to put a lot of thought into it because I, that does frighten me that uh, it would take a long time to get that kindergarten teacher back and it could, take a long time to get that Dale Street person back, you know? Yeah, I would say, too, like, if, if you remember the conversations we had a few years ago when when class size was, was an issue in the budget year, I forget, it was maybe three years ago, I'm not sure the exact year. Yeah. Um, at that point, at the public hearing, I believe I recommended the reduction of, of staffing at the middle school because it was, it was two years of small groups going through there. Um, right. And we ended up, you know, you guys ended up voting to put them back in um so they had those really small classrooms in at the middle school for the last couple of years well they're starting to get into the high school mm -hmm. so I, that's why we felt a little more comfortable with some of these reductions with a smaller group going into the high school than we've had in the years past and, and the other piece is that you know we're our projections have uh kindergarten for next year at 223 we're at 176 right now right so um so to some extent i still i feel better about that knowing those numbers but at the same time it doesn't mean that those uh class sizes are s uh any smaller uh, well no i mean you know our our target for kindergarten is 22 but what happens and again this is not being able to project into the future none of us are fortune tellers but if we think about it and even if we dip this year or next year in terms of population, we will go back up again. Economies do recover. And I, I have great faith that people will continue to think that Medfield is a, a really wonderful place to be and a great place to want to raise their children. Although houses are, houses are still selling here yeah, <laughs> this I summer. Know. They're just not moving in as quickly. They'll be moving yeah. in this summer. But I think, you know, I mean, I've, I know that we've been working very hard with, you know, real estate agents and, and everyone else in the community to really make people aware that as soon as they know that they're coming. So I feel okay about that number right now. Obviously, we've, we've gotten caught off guard before, um, but not in these circumstances. But I do but, think that in a couple of years, we're going we're gonna to have a problem and we need to be look, we need to be constructing a, a long term plan around how it is we would put those back in if we need to in the future, right? I mean, so I in terms of, are here for a while. In terms of the kindergarten, Jess, I think, you know, looking at the, the nice part about that and, and the way that gives us flexibility is because full day kindergarten is a tuition-based program, we can pay for half that salary through tuition. Right. So that, that gives us a little more flexibility to add those positions back if they, if they need to. Like for instance, if we, if we have, um, you know, 15 or 20 kids move in over the summer in kindergarten, with this budget right here, we'd probably be able to um, at least figure out a way to, to get another kindergarten teacher in here if we really needed to, okay. you know, because you have that flexibility. Whereas you don't have that at, at Blake, you don't have that at Dale Street or, or right. Wheelock because we're not, they're not tuition-based programs, so. And, and I have to say, I think probably Dale Street is the one that concerns me the, the most now. Yeah especially with those large classes going in there i'm i'm worried about uh the extra size classes uh the, the larger classes uh the fatigue on both the students and the teachers with the larger class loads uh, particularly at the high school if we're talking 20 over 26 in a classroom times five classes uh that's a lot of kids uh you know for each teacher um and uh, in the middle school as well if they're going to be you know uh, those larger classes. So, um, uh, well, I, high school populations tend to be more, um, a little bit forgiving on because that. Because of the, the scheduling, it tend, you know, you can have quite a large class and then have one that's somewhat smaller, but you know, my kids will be there next year. So, um, I mean, I'm not sure if there's language in the contract about, about caseload for teachers. Um, uh, I wasn't sure if there was, but, um, so, but yeah, I echo, uh, 
what Jess was referring to about, you know, all of our students are going to have some sort of extra fatigue um, and not knowing what the fall is going to look like is adding some extra pain to this as well, because mm -hmm. we may need some extra professional development of some kind over the summer to prep for whatever it is we're going to be doing in September. So on top of that, um, so I, um, yeah, so I, I'm, I'd like to, you know, I'm, I know we have, this is not the end of the conversation. Obviously, we need to go into tomorrow and continue more conversation as well. Um, but looking at it, uh, at all these options and being able to um, pick maybe parts of parts of some of them and put them, you know, together to come up with a plan. And I know you and Mike will do that um, and, you know, and advise what's possible in, you know, what's possible and what's the best fit. So, um, but, you know, keeping those items in mind that, you know, that Jess and others uh, were talking about is definitely important. Um, I do worry about those sizes because obviously that was kind of my thing uh, around class size. And, um, and so it is very concerning. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, and it's concerning for the, you know, for the teachers. Um, you know, three more, three more of my sons in machines class this year, and uh, that may have been that, that may have been it. So <laughs> we um, we all feel like that sometimes. <laughs> hey Jeff, um, question about summer PD around preparation for reentry, etc. Is there a possibility with that COVID, you know, the CARES Act that that could be considered um, money towards um, or reimbursement towards that PD work? That's a great question. So Christine and I did talk about that yesterday. Christine Trewiler and I talked about that yesterday. So we're gonna look into that uh, because you notice that there's no reduction here listed for R&D because we feel that's pretty important uh, going into the summer and, and what we have to do and, and plan for. And, you know, we will, we're targeted to get that guidance by the, from the state on June 15th. And, um, you know, he told us yesterday that, uh, it's, it's not just 85, but expect 90% of what happens or what you need to do in the fall to be directed from us in DPH. So it really doesn't give a lot of flexibility to school districts. And, um, you know, we're going to be told pretty much what we need to do and, and what that looks like. So, Again, a lot depends on, even though we're getting the guidance in June, that we're told to be prepared for changes in August if things go, you know, uh, up or down in terms of the pandemic, so. So have teachers already submitted um, their R&D request? No, or no, have, no, okay. no, because we're actually, um, we're actually gonna decide what they are this year. Okay. Uh, based on what the guidance is. Right, okay. So we're, we're gonna try to enlist teachers based on what the guidance is and, and have them, um, you know, key people like department chairs and so on and other teachers to, to get involved in that in that process. But it's not gonna be, you know, typically we have the R&D that it needs to align with our strategic plan and needs to be an issue that we're working on as a district, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this time we have to really direct that because we're not sure exactly uh, what it's gonna look like in September and we need to make sure we have plans around. Or January or March. Yeah, January, right. You know, this, so that we really need to be thinking about continuity of learning, which you know. Again, I'm just stating it for the people who are watching. We need to be watching for the, we need to be making sure that we're thinking about continuity and not having to go back to, not having this be the thought around just re-entry, that, that this is really a continuity issue and how do we continue that learning that we've got going if we need to leave for a week if we need to you know, back off for a period of time. One of the other things I, I wonder about is that I know that in terms of um, the way that businesses have been phased in in terms of their um, workforce is, uh, you know, like for instance, my husband's business, or my husband's office, they're really only allowed to have 25% of their usual um, uh, group there. And one of the things and I, I kind of quickly want to put out there is that I don't know. I mean, if, if there is a point in which the state kind of says you can only have this many kids in a classroom, how, again, is that money that we could conceivably use uh, as COVID reimbursement to be able to, to decrease the class sizes? Obviously, we can't use that now that's not what that money is used for but how are we 
how do we think flexibly about that and about those possibilities? Yeah, it's a pretty narrow definition right now is what they've yeah. given us. So we're, we're hoping that it gets broader so we'll be able to do some of that. Yeah. So in, in a, Jess, this is kind of along the same lines. I know we can't predict the future, but either there's I don't know, federal stimulus money that we find or, or, you know, that's class is half full or DC comes back with some recommendations and infrastructure is, you know, going to cost us more money in order to be safe. Do we then, you know, Jeff, is that when you, you take this that, that we have and you start um, pivoting as best you can with the, the bodies and, and people that you yeah, I think we do, we do that anyway, right? We'd have to do that if, if, if additional, I mean, I'm, I'm not worried about the stimulus at this point. I'm, I'm worried about additional cuts that all of a sudden the 10% that we're planning for, which again, I, I think is the right way to do it, turns into 25%, right? And then we're looking at additional 15% revenue loss in the town, in the schools, and that would require us to do additional cuts. So I think, you know, that's my, my big concern right now. And it, it's just, you know, you're doing it in the dark, right? You can't figure it out. You just can't because you don't know what's happening. You don't know whether or not, um, you know, you're going to have uh, level funded Chapter 70 or you're going to have additional cuts to Chapter 70. You don't know if you're going to be in school live or not. Um, so it's it's difficult. And, and listen, we're not the only district. Everyone's going through this right now. Everyone. Uh -huh. Everyone is going yeah. through the same thing. Uh, they're trying to figure it out as best they can without the crystal ball. And it's, it's just not, it's not great. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, a lot just, of just to, SOSs on our list on our list, sir, for uh, school committee, in which people are just gutted. Particularly, again, I have to say, in underserved communities in in Western Mass, you know that there is a real divide in our in our state, and we don't no want doubt. to forget that. No doubt. You know, it's a little bit like um, it's it's two very different states. In a lot of these communities, I understand why uh, Desi would think very much about uh, mandating most of the interventions because it would be easy not to do them. There are a lot of school districts that simply cannot afford anything. And there are communities, and I, I think we need to know this, that, that COVID has literally touched every single child in that community in the last three months perhaps even more than deaths through opiates, you know, or, and, or other issues around poverty and lack of resources or consistent resources. And, and they need to, they're trying to think about equity at the same time. Um, and it's necessary that we think about that too. I understand that that it's important to mandate some of the stuff so that they can make sure that every child gets served. Anyway, that was my uh, second filibuster for the night. <laughs> so, I mean, I think it, at this point, um, again, a lot, a lot to digest. I, I encourage you to take a look at the, all the positions that we have there, not just the ones we re recommended and, and to see if you have additional um, guidance for us tomorrow and, and see where you want us to go. Um, the reduction options are there as well. I mean, they're certainly, we've, we've chosen some of them as our, as our recommendation, but that doesn't mean you can't choose another one. So um, I think that's what we're trying to put all options up here for you. So give us some direction tomorrow. And, and, and please know that you can still give us direction tomorrow and still vote the budget line item that needs to be voted for the town. So you can still vote that, that number and we can still be doing this work, you know, going forward and figuring out if, if you feel comfortable with us doing that, so. Well, that's, uh, that would be my hope. I mean, I, I think we have to, we have to have some sort of versatility here, you know, be able to be agile in this process uh, because as soon as you get guided, you know, two weeks from now or two weeks or less, we're gonna have guidance, we're gonna have to make adjustments again. So uh, I think that's just gonna be the name of the game. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, 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 I um, just, just I'll say it now and I can ask it tomorrow, but that, that's where my head goes is um, trying to I use the word level fund or level service, trying to educate next year will be harder and it will cost more no matter what, whether it's hybrid or, or what. Um, and I, 
I almost, the, the big picture is you know, those reduction options. And, you know, you're having $690,000 of it is cutting staff. I, I wonder, like, did you guys have a second way of trying to get there that has less of that? Because, I, I mean, people do give us, you know, ability to flex, which is going to be essential. That, that's just my initial read on it. Yeah, you know, Tim, I would say that when you're looking at 80% of your budget being people, um, we, we made those reductions in non-payroll cuts twice. Um, we still have to pay our bills. So I think that that's why we're looking at uh, it's impossible to, to cut $1 million out of your budget without people. It's impossible. No, I understand. And, and, and there might be, I don't know whether it's, it's a topic in an exec session. You know, they say, you, you said there's, there's certain topics we can't talk about. Um, uh, I don't mean you want to be cautious, but, yeah. but you know, th those, are, those are things that there is different ways uh, to do that. Jeff, quite, I may have already asked this, but I've forgotten um, the computer equipment. Um, are, are we make? Have we made other arrangements to get that ahead of time? Is that yeah. why that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and, and under the circumstances, we're probably going to need it. Is what I mean. Yeah, <laughs> so, no, so I would say that you know, with, with some savings from FY20, um, you know, contract uh, bus contract savings, those kinds of things, we're able to do that. Okay. I just want to confirm that we were able to do that because obviously it's going to uh, be needed. So. Yep. Frankly, to, to save their receipts for their ink printers <laughs> and give them to us so that we can reimburse through COVID. That was a joke, oh, by goodness. the way, but I do think that we will be thank looking Thank goodness. For I, I just hmm? have visions of receipts everywhere. I, hey, Michael can handle that. Don't worry about it. Yeah. Man's a genius, um, but no, it is a joke. But I, I you know, there we are going to be looking for reimbursable expenses, and because that is at this time again, we can't, we have no crystal ball, and I have not seen this administration particularly interested in uh, revenue replacement. So. Um, anything we get needs to be kind of backed up literally like your CVS receipts for your FSA. I mean, it's, it is just uh, labor intensive and um, seen from a very negative point, I think, that everything is about whether you actually deserve this or not when there are just a lot of people hurting. Um, and that's not necessarily a, a political statement. I just think that there's a real fault in how this first wave of money was distributed. It was not the emergency rescue that we needed to keep things from getting worse. Okay. Uh, um, I, was, I was also wondering, could the technology equipment be counted as a, as a COVID need for reimbursement, right? To enable that, like the, like the Zoom licensing, for instance, itself. <laughs> Uh, anything like that is directly yeah. impacted. I mean, I think we, the Zoom licenses would definitely qualify, but we we did not purchase any um, technology or any devices to support kids for COVID. So we had them already in in place. Uh, we had them for that were all designated as our MCAS uh, machines. So those yeah. were the ones that we handed out. So we, we couldn't we wouldn't we didn't buy any to get reimbursable. Mm -hmm. There was there was a different unfunded mandate. Correct. <laughs> Correct. It's hard to keep, yeah, it's hard to keep track sometimes. Yeah. Anime, right. what do you think um, at this point? Uh, I, I think that kind of the takeaways and the things we got, we, we need to think about is really, you know, where, where do you want us to go in terms of reductions? Um, deviate from what our recommendations are or not, whatever you wanted, want us to do. And then um, begin the process of start thinking about if we do get additional funds, how do we, where, where does it go first and how do we start bringing people back? So right, absolutely. I think that's the, the two, the big, the big items that we need to start thinking about. Yeah. And I think, you know, your guiding principles, the way you and Michael, you know, attacked this um, most unfortunate exercise, um, you know, with the least amount of, to minimize, you know, the impact for opportunities for students and impact existing staffing and then impact unemployment. That, that was a thoughtful process. 
and um, as, as painful as this is. And um, this is, it's a lot to think about and we'll digest this knowing those guiding principles, but, and, and, um, and we'll go into it tomorrow. We have, so everyone knows, we have executive session at five o'clock tomorrow. Oh, do we? Uh, I think on the agenda it said it was at the end. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. It is. Yep. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, so I actually, I wanted to clarify that for people you know who. I, I think I put the wrong date in there for parents late. last night. Yeah, it did say 5:30 in the yeah. email, but okay. then I so, I send that to, tomorrow because yeah. I. Of this program for that five and five thirty, I see. No, exactly. So five o'clock tomorrow, folks. Bring your questions, comments, um, and and thank you very much um, for tuning in. Um, Can I just say one thing before you go? Um, this was probably the probably the worst year for me to be appointed to the budget subcommittee. Thank uh, you. <laughs> Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Sorry. You know, municipal finance is, it's complicated. Um, it was a long process that a lot of different people played a role in. Um, a pandemic landed in the middle of an already kind of structurally problematic uh, a budget. And now we're awaiting things that we don't know are going to happen or not. Like, I, I want to reiterate what Jeff said. It, it, it's like planning a budget in the dark completely. Um, but it's worth noting out that the town side is is losing, they're making cuts as well. It's not just the schools. This is a town-wide uh, thing that's happening. And that I, I, just, I know there's a lot of teachers listening in right now and if there's one thing that they can take away from this discussion and our discussions hopefully tomorrow is that um, you did nothing wrong and Medfield values you. And I hate that it is going to come down to people and I've, I've been in your shoes and uh, it's, it's demoralizing and it can feel demeaning and I don't want any of you to lose faith that Medfield doesn't value you, because we do. And um, we're trying to find a way through this, and uh, hopefully we will. Very well said, Megan. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been difficult. It's been difficult for Warrant Committee, for the Board of Selectmen. For us, this has been painful. Um, but we will reconvene tomorrow i think we have to can we, can we give them um, can we give people your email address again or the the school committee chair yeah for the receipts is that where the receipts are going yes yeah actually they're going uh right to you leo to anime yeah <laughs> sc uh, yeah <laughs> sc chair at email.medfield.net for really any one of us just yeah, for sure. Um, so just a reminder, Megan, Glenn, and Jess Riley are on the budget subcommittee. And um, so thank you to, I'm rough, but thank you again, Jeff and Michael and the Warrant and the Board of Selectmen. It's been. And thank you so much to all of you for. for yeah. Right. Yeah, the teachers out there, I want to thank you all for the work you've been doing. I, there's a, such a large collection of them here, so we don't get a chance to, to voice that. So uh, this is absolutely unprecedented time in education. And, I thought um, we banned that. What's that? Unprecedented. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My bad. Uh, you know, I don't think anyone, even in the 80s when budgets were terrible for schools, you know, um, and then to, you know, through the last stressors this is definitely something that has been we've never uh we've never had to face before so i i um i thank you all for rolling with it and uh dr marsden and your team for um continuing to lead the way and and guide everybody so um is we will there will be an end to this i'm i know i'd like to be the optimist um but it's it's not going to come as quickly as we hope i guess so Alrighty. All right. Thank you ever so much. And I really hope that I hear and that we hear from um, many of you. Uh, Jeff, when could this meeting be up 
on uh, our website? Could we just I'll check throw it up relatively quickly or because I think people might want to see it. Hmm? Yeah, I'll check with Owen, I'm sure. Relatively. Okay, because I mean, obviously, since we have, you know, this turnaround time between now and tomorrow's meeting, right? we, we certainly hope to vote on the budget. We'd like to give that town that the, the town the feeling of that stability. Right. Um, you know, it would be nice to be able to have people be able to review it. So. Okay, I'll check with Owen. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Uh, so moved. Second. Seconded by Leo, seconded by Jess. I'll do a roll call. Jess Riley. Aye. Leo Brem. Aye. Megan Glenn. Aye. Tim Knight. Aye. Anna Mayo Shea Brook. Aye. All righty. Thank you. See you tomorrow.